Um, today, um, uh, well, let me advance the slide. Today, I would um, like to introduce um, two speakers who um, I hopefully will have a good conversation about um, Tibet uh, and the uh, Tibet and India, <coughs> both in the 10th and 11th century and, and today in the 21st century, and considering really how ideology moves with art. I mean, this is what I've been been thinking about a lot in terms of this show. My speakers are, are Donald Lopez, who is the Arthur E. Link Distinguished University Professor of Buddhist and Tibetan Studies at the University of Michigan, and is the chair. Um, Donald's written numerous books, um, and most recently has produced or uh, co-edited uh, with Robert Buswell um, the Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism, which I think is going to be useful it certainly will be useful to me, and I, I recommend that. Uh, I think the other thing that uh, is, is quite interesting and pertinent to this exhibition um, is the account of um, Gendun Chopal, um, who was a, um, uh, a monk who spent 12 years in India and Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, he's translated that uh, in Grains of Gold, Tales of a Cosmopolitan Traveler. Um, the other speaker is Tenzing Rigdal. Um, who is an artist who contributed a work um, to the exhibition, Tibet in India. Um, but Tenzing is someone uh, who's been extremely prolific um, in this last year, um, has shows in London, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, and New York, um, and many shows. I, and he's working in all sorts of media, so I, uh, I think he's doing very interesting things, and I'm, I'm glad that he can also um, be here. Um, when I thought to organize this exhibition, um, I was really looking to, th to think about North India and oh, excuse me, North India and, and Tibet, and to consider how um, individuals like Atisha, who traveled up in 1042 AD to, um, to Tibet at the invitation of the Tibetans, he brought Buddhism. Um, and he brought a form of Buddhism that became enormously popular with, with the public. Uh, he, he, though, had this great uh, authority as a, um, as a monk coming from one of the great monasteries of North India um, and the, the place where the Buddha lived. And I think this is, this is an important... Oh, my Buddha's disappeared. Uh, maybe I can get it to come back. Um, it's an important um, way of, of, of thinking about transmission. When, when these people came down out of Tibet, uh, monks and scholars, translators, um, and we're seeing images of the Buddha, uh, like this, this great 10th or 11th century um, piece from the Buddhist site of Nalanda. Um, it had great authenticity because it was the image of the Buddha um, in the place of the Buddha. And so when they were bringing these images back um, to Tibet, um, you know, it, they, were, they were models to be um, to be copied in some sense, but they gave form to a whole set of ideology, and I think this is, this is an interesting um, phenomenon. Maybe my next slide. Ah, here we go. Um, it's a moment of, of sort of, in a sense, great complexity. Buddhism had changed. Um, the initial uh, form of Buddhism that Shakyamuni had, uh, had sort of offered in perhaps the 4th or 5th century BC, um, had, had evolved by the 10th and 11th centuries, um, and ideas of Buddhas residing in heavens had become quite important, um, the Tathagatas. Um, and here we have a crown Buddha that probably is, is conceptually um, a, a living Buddha that's residing in a heaven that one could hope to encounter in a future life. Uh, you could be reborn in that, in that pure land. Um, and I think it's this kind of Buddhism that um, was particularly appealing um, in Tibet. Uh, so we can see in this, this tanka from the 11th century um, of Ratnasambhava. Um, notice the jewelry, the, the, the sort of presentation of a Buddha um, flanked by bodhisattvas, surrounded by celestial beings um, in another realm. Um, but with that, um, I encourage you all to come and see the exhibition, um, and I, I want to turn the, the podium over to, to Donald Lopez and, and hear a few of his thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. There you go. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Kurt for organizing this wonderful show and, and for inviting me to come from cold Ann Arbor to cold New York to speak uh, 
this afternoon. <clears throat> uh, when we think about um, authentic authenticity and authority in religion, we often think uh, that those are measured by the distance from the origin. That is, the closer to the founder one is, the more authentic the tradition might be judged. And therefore, the Gospels, the four authors of the Gospels, took the names of disciples as if they had been direct disciples of Jesus. We think about the direct descendants of the prophet Muhammad. Uh, but when we think about Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, we have the problem of it being rather late. Uh, so the Buddha, as Kurt mentioned, lived in India probably around 400 BCE. Uh, and then we have various developments happening in the tradition over the course of uh, about 1,500 years. Uh, Buddhism had already gone to China uh, in probably in the first century uh, CE. Buddhism was well established in China, in Japan, and in Korea before it ever went to Tibet in the seventh century. And so among the, the, the large traditions, the great traditions of Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism is the latest and the last. And so from one perspective, it's the farthest from the origin. On the other hand, it's the tradition that has something that the other forms of Buddhism in Asia do not have, which is the full transmission of the tantric teachings. So despite the fact that people like Amogavadra brought tantra to China, <clears throat> and from China it was taken by Kukai to Japan, there is a, okay. there is a, a form of tantra called Anutra Yoga Tantra, highest yoga tantra, which was only transmitted to Tibet. And of course, to the followers of Anutra Yoga Tantra, it's only this form of Buddhist practice that, that can bestow Buddhahood. And so the claim that we find in Tibetan Buddhism is that it's only by practicing one form, the highest form of Tantra, that one can achieve enlightenment. And not only that, but that all Buddhas of the past, including Shakyamuni, <coughs> the historical Buddha, practiced the Nutra Yoga Tantra in order to achieve Buddhahood himself. And so when we look at Tibetan Buddhism, what is important then is that we have the full transmission of the Indian tradition. After Xuanzang made his journey uh, to to India and the Tang Dynasty, the Chinese were not that interested in what was happening in, in, in India anymore. They had pretty much what they needed, and Chinese Buddhism developed from that point. But we have Tibetans visiting India all the way until the, the demise of, of India, the demise of Buddhism in North India uh, in, the, in the 12th and 13th centuries, and this is very important. So when we look at the history of Tibetan Buddhism, as you probably know, it came to, Buddhism came to Tibet in two waves. Uh, the first in the seventh century, the Tibetans simply called the earlier spread or earlier dissemination of the Dharma. This is the time when uh, the Chinese princess Wen Chung supposedly brought the first Buddha image uh, to Tibet. She married the Tibetan king, converted him to Buddhism. Um, then the ne a king uh, called Tisong Detsen established the first monastery at Samye, invited the Bodhisattva abbot Shantarakshita to come from India. Uh, Padma Sambhava also to come. They established Samye and or ordained the Semidun, the first seven Tibetans to become Buddhist monks. Uh, after that was the famous debate between Kamala Shila and the uh, Chan monk uh, Hoshang, Hoshang Mohoyen. So this first period is one that is so wreathed in myth that it's very difficult for us to know really with great precision what happened. Uh, we think probably that Princess Wenchang was intended to marry uh, uh, Song Sangampo's son, but by the time she got from all the way from China, from Chang'an in the capital to Lhasa, he had died. So she married the old father and he died a few years later and whether she ever converted him to Buddhism, we don't know. Uh, Padmasambhava, of course, difficult question whether he was historical figure. We think he probably was, but exactly who he was. Was he a diviner or someone who brought the Tibetans various irrig irrigation techniques? We really don't know. Of the Samye debate, was that a face-to-face -face event, uh, or was it just an exchange of documents? We don't really know for sure. We do know that in 842, uh, the Tibetan king, uh, a bad king called Lang Dharma, was assassinated by, uh, by a Buddhist monk who shot him through the heart with an arrow. And this is the end of the first uh, spreading of, of the Dharma to, to Tibet. Uh, and this is also the end of the Tibetan monarchy. This then begins a period of roughly 200 years, uh, which we used to call the dark period. It doesn't seem so dark anymore after some re recent research. 
in which the direct transmission of Buddhism between India and Tibet, which had really been uh, something that was built on, on this, this royal uh, patronage of the king inviting these masters to come, that ended because there was no king anymore, and there never was a king again in Tibetan history. So we have to then get to the second period, which is called the, 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 the later dissemination, the, the Chidat, and that's when we see people like uh, Atisha, who's disappeared from the screen, uh, arriving uh, in 1042. This is a period in which we know a lot more uh, because we have a lot of the accounts of, this is not so much a period of simply masters being invited from India to Tibet, but Tibetans going to India and studying at the great monasteries of the, uh, in Bengal and Kashmir. So um, this period then is one in which we have a lot of, of, of accounts of people making these travels. And here, this figure of Atisha is, is a very important person. So we, there are three uh, dates uh, in Tibetan history, all of which end in the number 42. Uh, 842, the assassination of the king and the end of the Tibetan monarchy. 1042, Atisha's arrival in Tibet. And then 1642, the Dalai Lama, fifth Dalai Lama being placed on the throne as the, as the, as the political ruler of the country. So despite the fact that this second dissemination didn't really begin with the Tisha, it began with the monk named Rinchen Songbo making, going to Kashmir and India to study. The Tibetans really put a lot of stock in the arrival of a Tisha uh, coming from Bikramashila Monastery to uh, Western Tibet in, in 1042. So why did he come? This is a very interesting question because, at least as the Tibetans tell the story, Atisha was by far the greatest of all scholars, the greatest monk in all of India. And yet, he left this very famous monastery and went to Tibet. Why would he do that? Well, he was very compassionate. Of course, we know that about him. Uh, but as the story is told, uh, the, the, the king of, of Western Tibet uh, sent a great amount of gold uh, to the monastery uh, to pay for Atisha to actually to pay the, the abbot and allow Atisha to come. Now, by the time that they arrived, there was already a, a kind of a Tibetan dorm at Vikramakshila Monastery. Enough Tibetans were coming down from Tibet, typically stopping off in Kathmandu to learn a little Sanskrit and some of the local language, then making their way down into Bengal, a very perilous trip, a lot of talk about uh, bandits and, and snakes. Um, and when they got to uh, the monastery, Atisha was not there. They waited around. Finally, uh, one of the monks, uh, Tibetan, was trying to recite the Heart Sutra, sitting outside, reciting the Heart Sutra in Sanskrit, mispronouncing it badly. And all the Indian pundits just walked by and didn't say a word. Then one kindly monk stopped and said, uh, Tibetan monk, uh, this is how you do it. Please pronounce it this way. Walked away. Later, it turned out that was Atisha that he had looked down upon. We have to think of the Tibetans really as kind of bumpkins, right? These kind of yokels coming down for, you know, from this, uh, this uncivilized place to the, to the cradle of civilization, to North India. Uh, and because they brought a lot of gold, I think they were tolerated and accepted at the monasteries. Uh, but would the, would the greatest teacher in all of India go back with them and leave his monastery to go, go to Tibet? Why would he do that? So. Eventually, uh, they told the story of why they'd come, and Atisha said that he, he would agree to come at least for a three-year period, um, but he had to get the abbot's permission. And so finally, uh, one of the Tibetans went to the abbot, who's a, a very eminent monk called Ratnakara, and said, would you please allow uh, Atisha to uh, take us on a three-year pilgrimage of the holy sites of India? And Ratnakara, being the abbot, was a very wise man, and he knew very well that they were not going to go on a pilgrimage. They were going to take him all the way back to Tibet. And he said, and this is recorded in the account from the time, why would, uh, why would I allow Atisha, the greatest scholar in all of India, to go to that yak pen of yours? Why would I let, let him go to Tibet of all places? Uh, we need him because he is the wisest of all monks. He, he, the keys that he wears on his belt are the keys to the monasteries of North India. He's skilled in all of the 18 schools of Buddhism of the day. He's a master of tantric practice. And we, and we have to be worried about the turuksha. The turuksha are coming. This turuksha is this word which uh, what they use to refer to the Muslims who were beginning to make incursions into North India. Based in Afghanistan, they would wait for this, the snows to melt each summer, come down through the Khyber Pass and make raids on Hindu and Buddhist temples, 
basically just looting. There was no, no particular religious persecution. Take what they got back, spend the next winter in Afghanistan, come down again. And each time they went, because they were bringing more and more things, more people wanted to go, and they started going further and further to the east. So the abbot apparently was worried that Atisha uh, was needed to, to use his ability to bring forward the wrathful deities to oppose the Turukshas who were going to invade. Of course, that didn't happen for at least another century, but that is the way the story is told. So we have this uh, rather implausible account of the greatest monk in all of India leaving behind his homeland to go to that yak pen of yours to teach the Dharma. So, of course, Atisha uh, is a very beloved figure. Um, the Atisha is just a nickname. It means the incomparable one. And even beyond that, Tibetans have another name for him, Joche. So in Tibet, uh, if you have just a nickname, if you're just known by your nickname, if you're Guru Rinpoche, the precious guru, or Jay Rinpoche, Tsongkhapa, or jo, jo, Joche, Atisha, that means you're big. You're just known by your nickname. People don't call him Dipankra Shri Jana, his, his, true, his true Sanskrit name. And when they tell the stories of, of his, uh, Atisha is a, is a three-dimensional figure. Uh, he, he's, he's witty. Uh, he's, uh, they ask him, uh, he's, going, he's trying to learn Tibetan, which endeared him to the Tibetans. Uh, they, they, he stopped and said, uh, what's the name for a rock? And they gave him the name for a boulder. And so later they were riding along in this long trip and he said, stop a minute, I have to get this boulder out of my boot. He didn't, and that was a big joke to the Tibetans. So the fact that uh, he was trying to learn their language, uh, a lot of stories are told about him on this trip and about his kindness to the, to the Tibetan monks uh, at Vikramashila before, before they left. On the other hand, we might question, and this is rather perhaps sacrilegious to, to suggest, that maybe Atisha was not that famous of a monk. Uh, and maybe Buddhism was not really that strong in India at that time. Because we know that Atisha, one of his, uh, the, one of the teachers to whom he was most devoted, the teacher who taught him about bodhicitta, the bodhisattva's aspiration to enlightenment, was called Serlingba, uh, Suvarnadvipa, Dharmakirti of Suvarnadvipa. Suvarnadvipa probably was Sumatra. And so the story is told in Atisha's biography of him getting on the boat and going to Sumatra to study with his teacher. Why would he have to go to Sumatra to study with a great Buddhist teacher in the 11th century? And so Atisha's story allows us to think about the state of Buddhism in India at the time that these pieces that you see upstairs were produced. They also allow us to think about the fact that Tibetans may have exaggerated to at least some extent the importance of this person who is so important to them in bringing the Dharma uh, to Tibet in the 11th century. So, what we're really seeing in the, in the show upstairs is this period in which these tantric works, right? The, this Buddhist tantra, this very difficult category to understand. We've made a lot of progress, I think, in the past 20 years, but still many mysteries remain as to exactly what it was and how this particular form of Buddhist practice, which frankly does involve a lot of sexual ritual, how did that made, make its way into mainstream Buddhism? That is, what we see when we read uh, the early tantras uh, is, what really appears to us is kind of garden variety magic, uh, various ways of gaining certain magical powers like to fly and find buried treasure and walk through walls, the usual sort of things. Very, very little reference to enlightenment, uh, to the Buddha, to Bodhi, to compassion. Those things are really not there so much. Uh, and then we see a couple centuries later this thing fully integrated into the, the Buddhist scholastic system. And so there's this moment that I often try to imagine and don't know quite what happened, to think of some monks at, at Nalanda Monastery, the great monastic university in Bihar, who go to their abbot and said, we were walking through the charnel ground the other day, and we saw some guys eating human flesh and having sex with 16-year-old out outcast girls. Could we become their disciples? Uh, and they seem to have done so. Uh, and so what we see with the Tisha then is this, this ritual practice, this tantric practice, this actual form of magic in many ways, becoming fully scholasticized, fully theologized, fully integrated into the Buddhist vocabulary so that by the time that someone like Atisha goes to Tibet, who he was himself a tantric master, it's something that then the Tibetans take on wholeheartedly and, and both study and practice with great diligence. 
uh, and it looks like my 20 minutes is up. So uh, just I'll just stop there, and uh, is that? Please you know, take some questions. Though. Okay, we have to take some questions. Okay, what was it? I think so. Yeah. Well, certainly I have a question. When we think of Atisha and, and this sort of relationship between the Mahayana and the Vajrayana that he's, he's bringing to Tibet and that sort of that fusion, how much of it can we attribute to, to him as an individual and how much is sort of a result of this, the, the many people probably who are moving back and forth? I mean, is it that things have been sort of fixed to Atisha as an individual because it's something to hold on to, or is it that? Oh, no, many people came, yeah, and many great tantric masters came, and and, and many Tibetans went to, to India to study with different tantric, tantric masters, such as Naropa, as, right, as, as Marpa did. So uh, he's just uh, particularly beloved because he made the trip, right. and, he, and he stayed until his death in 1056. And so uh, all sects of Tibetan Buddhism sort of look back to him with a lot of affection, uh, in terms of bringing the tantric system, he was one of one of many who did that, right? Yeah. Well, let's, so now we'll uh, turn to this this next moment, which is really not so much uh, Indian art uh, going to Tibet, but Tibetan art coming to the world. So I'd like to introduce uh, Tenzin Rikdrol, whose name means in Tibetan, one who upholds the teaching and whose mind is liberated. Come on. <laughs> Can I have a slide? No. Okay. Uh, good evening and touch delay. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you all for being very kind and generous with your time to attend the, this talk. I would also like to thank the Metropolitan Museum of Art for inviting me here to talk about my artworks and thoughts behind it. I'm also very honored to share the stage with our curator, Mr. Kurt, and Professor Donald Lopezla. Um, <clears throat> I would like to begin my talk with the word art in Tibetan language. Um, in Tibetan language, the word art translates to gutsel. Etymologically, the word gutsel comes from two different words, gu and tsel. Gu means illusion or magic or magical, and tsel means skill or dexterity. Uh, the word is particularly interesting to me because many scholars of Tibetan studies tend to categorize Tibetan traditional Buddhist art as being a mere work of craftsmanship. But when one carefully looks at the word alone, one can see that it's not just the skills or dexterity that compounds to a meaning of an artwork in Tibetan tradition, but it also needs the magic to make it a work of art. I'm personally very interested in all forms of Tibetan traditional art, and I try to study as much as I can to learn about the various traditional Tibetan art forms and its history and its evolution. Tibetan traditional art can generally be understood as a syncretic influence experienced by the Tibetan <coughs> artists initially from India and then from Nepal and then finally from China within the time frame of 7th to 20th century. From India came 
the system of iconometry, the uh, attributes, attire and the jewelries of the deities. From Nepal came the meticulous style of painting and from China came the influence of landscape painting in Tibetan traditional art. When one digs a little deeper, the Tibetan traditional Buddhist art could also be understood as a pictorial philosophy, where the deities are rather used as an aesthetic element to express the complex philosophical doctrines of Buddhism. <coughs> so, to state it briefly, I have come to understand that the traditional work of art is rather a stage to explicate and explain Buddha's thought. And after that, <coughs> I try to use the mere forms of the various deities as a stage to express my own personal thoughts, thoughts that are contemporary <coughs> that are of contemporary issues, thoughts that deals with my limited worldviews of our current problems and so forth. The stage then becomes a space for an individual expression. So in my work, I assume that the viewer confronts the work of art with his or her own cumulative experiences and indulges into an art of meaning-making. I use the traditional iconographies or the visual grammatology of Tibetan traditional art to rather express my personal thoughts and feelings with utmost genuineness. So this painting is probably one of the early examples of such thoughts. Here I was trying to give tribute to the Tibetan classical painting, uh, specifically the uh, Menri style. <clears throat> but at the same time, I was also trying to individualize the painting. The core theme of the painting is what would happen to Tibet after His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama leaves our uh, mundane world. So the, uh, there's a compassion deities, Mandela, with, uh, without the deity, but just the footprints. Also, with regards to my methods or approaches towards the subject matter, I do not cling to a linear approach. I try to look at a subject matter as much as I can without a method at hand, so that the expression of a subject matter could take any kinds of form. It could become a painting, a poetry, a performance, a sculpture, or a photography, or a site-specific art. I feel that the freedom of expression must begin at the very moment when the artist comes in contact with his or her subject matter. Therefore, the artworks that come out of me are in many different media. I try not to be defined by the so-called style of my work. So in this kind of artworks, the collage pieces, I'm playing with the idea of Tibetan identity. Uh, as discussed earlier, the major influences in Tibetan traditional art comes from India, Nepal, and China. And in this particular work, I was trying to reduce or completely remove all the influences of those countries. I exaggerate the attire, and then I remove all the detail attributions. Thus, I remove the Indian influence, and then I completely change the style of painting, which meant the removal of a Nepalese influence. And then I completely removed the landscape from the painting in an attempt to remove the Chinese influence. And instead, I paste the background with Tibetan scripture, which is written in a standard Tibetan script called Uchen. Then I asked myself, after removing all the influences, do I have what I call a Tibetan art? And this piece I made um, right when I was experiencing New York life, and I, was mo I moved to New York. And um, so I took the inspiration of the piece from probably, I think, 7th century Buddha Pada. Um, and it is said that initially there was no image of Buddha, but most of the images were rather Buddha Pada or maybe Stupa. But uh, so I took that image and When I look at the map, it's always very fascinating. It's like it's supposed to show you the way or guidelines. So 
um, when I was in New York, everybody was trying to teach me how to uh, use the subway system, and so I thought it'll be uh, interesting. Uh, this artwork is my response to the continual self-emulation that is taking place throughout the Tibetan regions. Um, the number of self-emulation in Tibet has reached 127. Uh, Tibetans burned themselves to protest against the communist China for the illegal occupation of Tibet. Uh, self-emulation has been by far the most unsettling experience of my life and I could never look at the fire the same way I did before. And um, I made this painting after hearing a very interesting Tibetan phrase. And it goes like, uh, if you stand, you hit your head. If you sit, you hit your bum. So I thought it would be very interesting to make an artwork, uh, somewhat like a personification artwork, about the Tibetans living in Tibet, with that phrase in mind, who, when rises above the water, finds themselves burning alive, and while remaining inside the water, he or she suffocates. The self-emulation in Tibet really took its root at the Kirti Monastery in Tibet, um, and then from there it spread throughout Tibet. At present, the operation of the Chinese government towards Tibetans are quite um, unimaginable, so I felt very strongly about it and wanted to make a very loud painting on the subject matter, and um, this is the product. So an acrylic. Um, also, a lot of my work, I try to uh, research on traditional Tibetan work and see, uh, try to analyze the methods and all. And um, so here I was experimenting with pure gold, um, uh, as there's also a very rich Tibetan tradition of gold painting called seri, which is painted on either black or red. And also in this painting, I was trying to combine my poetry uh, with the gold painting. And uh, this is the result. In 2011, I made a site-specific installation in Dharamsala, India, and it was titled Our Land, Our People. Dharamsala is a very special place for all the Tibetans. Tibetan government in exile is located there, along with its democratically elected prime minister and ministers. It is also the residence of the 14 Dalai Lama. Along with him, majority of Tibetans in exile live in and around Dharamsala. So I felt that it is a, a perfect place for the site-specific uh, art. The idea of the installation came to me from what my father used to say before he passed away. He was uh, diagnosed with cancer, and within six months of the diagnosis, he passed away. He used to tell me that he wanted to go back to Tibet at least once before he would pass away. But he couldn't go back to Tibet, and his wishes remained unfulfilled. And uh, sometime after my father's death, one night I had an idea. I couldn't go, uh, I had an idea, so um, I was thinking about what my father said and how my father, despite his wishes, couldn't go back to Tibet. Then I realized that they, there are many Tibetans like my father who couldn't go back to Tibet due to their political reasons. And then I thought maybe I could bring Tibet or a small part of Tibet to them. So this was the initial idea of the site-specific installation. So I made plans to transport 20,000 kilograms of soil from Tibet to India through Nepal. And the journey was a bit difficult and dangerous one. And altogether, it took me about 17 months. And after crossing more than 50 checkpoints and border securities, 
I managed to get the soil into Dharamsala and exhibit it. So, so basically I made three dimensional sculpture of a Tibetan flag which also looked like a stage and laid the 20,000 kilograms of soil on top of it and had people walk on it. And I also had a standing microphone in which they could say and share whatever they feel while they were standing on the Tibetan soil. So this was the installation. <coughs> then I also presented a sample of the soil to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama at his residence and he responded by writing Tibet on it in its standard Tibetan script, Uchen. The whole journey has been documented and made into a full-length feature documentary and my friend um, Tenzin Seten is the director of the film and I produced it um, and uh, at the moment they're traveling film festivals so if you have time then I can show the trailer Somehow, I got this idea, inspiration for my father. The sculpture itself is like a stage on which I lay the uh, soil as from Tibet, and then I would have a request the participant or the audience to really uh, walk on it and then just uh, exhibit their feelings and express their feelings. And uh, so that that's that's the uh, project.
Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, perhaps um, people have some questions for, for Victor, uh, especially about this latest piece as well. Installation was only for three days, and um, after that, we asked everyone to take uh, the soil, and uh, with a few hours, everyone took everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little worried initially, and I also looked for a space to store it because after doing all this thing, you can't just throw it away. <laughs> so then, um, yeah, everybody took it home. Some, so yeah. Yeah, I've had shows, few shows there. Okay. Yeah. From where do you currently practice your art, and have you had any interaction with the Chinese government? Um, for the film, yes, uh, some interaction. Um, you mean where do I practice? Where do I paint? Yeah, what is your home base now? Are you in oh, I live in um, New York. Yeah, but I. Paint everywhere. Can uh, you freely go back and forth? To no, no, I, I can't go there. <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm trying to go there very soon. And if I get arrested, you have to come to protest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, not now. I can't go there. How old were you when I was when you started? Oh, um, very young. I think I think everyone can be artists. Mm -hmm. It's just surprising that why not many are in you know, art. I think for me, um, studying accounting. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I think I think uh, it is more difficult not to be an artist. I think. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I started very young, and um, my um, mother always, you know, used to put the drawings and paintings on, f you know, we didn't have fridge, what do you call it, like on the uh, walls and stuff like that. So had this small show. <laughs> what kind of government does it have now? It's an exile government. It's a democratically elected. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but Tibet is part of China now, right? Tibet oh itself I is part of the PRC. Oh, you mean yeah. over there? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that? Yeah. That's like Chinese government now. I'm sorry. I was interested in your name. Could you tell us about uh, how you got your name? Is that your your birth name you were named when you were a baby, or you earned your name? Yeah, usually the Tibetans, uh, the name were usually given by Lama or Monk or Rupa And whenever they give a name, they give half of their, uh, the Lama's name, and half they created. So I got the name from uh, Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama. So his name is Tenzin Gyatso. So he gives the first half name as a blessing. And the second half name creates it. So we don't have like how usually a last name or a cast name or something like that. So yeah. Could you explain a little bit the symbolism in the first work of art? I think it was from if you passed it too fast, there was so much there I couldn't focus on it. Would you please explain some of those symbols? 
I imagine that's possible to work. But it took me, I think, probably four months to compose just the composition. It took me probably nine months to paint. But I like the idea that one can look at it and slowly discover it, you know, rather than me giving out everything. <laughs> 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 I think <laughs> you know, the first work of art, which I think it was you mentioned, I think it's called A Brief History of Tibet. Um, it looks very cubist in the way it's like sort of divided into different shapes. So when you were painting it, did you did you think of the work as fragmented or as a whole? And do you do you think that Fragmented. Yeah, I. Like when Dubai has to do is somehow related to maybe how Tibetans see themselves or how Westerners view Tibet and its history. Yeah, when I studied Cubist, I love Picasso's work, mm -hmm. especially when Kurt told me you know, like some big donation given by a collector to the museum. It was like, quite exciting news for me. Uh, Leonard Lauder. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, yeah, so, so. It's too quiet. He's being weird. He's being louder. Is this mic on? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, so I love Picasso, and but also at the same time, I was using the uh, Picasso's uh, idea of um, um, cessation of time, and then trying to show. Uh, a complete picture of anything that's three-dimensional into a one single plane. But then I like the idea of that uh, cessation of time at the same time it could also be eternal. So then I was using the Tibetan idea of um, interdependence. So even though it's boxed, you know, or in very uh, mathematical, but it is also in <coughs> such a way that if one box is taken out, it's on a fall off. Mm -hmm. So my idea was at that time, the painting should be like a sky. But for me, at that time, this is a big painting. It's like 10 feet, so I thought, wow, this is big. It's like sky. And uh, when somebody looks at it, it's like you, the person who's looking at it is in the ocean, looking at the sky. And this whole thing is like a big movie, you know? So Picasso's, um, yeah, I, I'm very influenced by Picasso, but not just by his uh, uh, cubism, but by his uh, his approach towards any subject matter. <coughs> I was wondering, um, were you <coughs> trained as a traditional Tonga painter before you started in this kind of no, actually, I, um, when I was studying at the University of Colorado, Denver, that's where I real realized that um, at that time I was painting like De Kooning, they were all like s superstars, <laughs> Jackson Pollock, De Kooning, Rothko. But it never, I always felt something, um, you know, I didn't feel that, you know, I was there, you know. So I, I started looking at Tibetan traditional art. So that's when I decided I should take a break from university. And I went to different places and studied, studied the Thangka painting. My, uh, the, the one that I studied was uh, Menri. Menri is uh, actually by long time back in Tibet, um, the respect to art artists was so, so high, you know. They even used to give name of Tulku, like Tulku Menla you know. Tulku is like almost like a So um, now it's very declined I mean, because of all these political reasons and all. But um, so his uh, uh, his tradition, you know, Menla mm -hmm. tradition, that's what I studied. Or maybe to be more precise, maybe Mensa. But then I studied Tibetan traditional art, maybe Thanka painting, collage, butter sculpture, sand painting, 
So I tried to study as much as I can. And uh, then I came back, and then I mixed it. So you have the cocktail. <laughs> Well, you know, on that, that issue, I mean, how do you see the, I don't know, all of this sort of this mix between tradition and, and modernity, how, how do you see that impacting, uh, I don't know, traditional arts within Tibet? Um, how is the Tibetan Buddhist community reacting to the contemporary emergence of the contemporary Tibetan art? <coughs> I think um, uh, the the Tibetan traditional art in Tibet, there are quite a lot of practice happening, um, but it is more uh, at the face of uh, you know the market and that, like many Chinese would, or Buddhists trying to commission the pa uh, painters. You know. um, but also at the same time, um, I always say the Tibetan traditional tradition of thoughts. It's like, uh, you know, Hembagyao means uh, patching, you know. What Buddha said, and everybody wants to be a footnote of Buddha. So it's all patch, 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 patch. Whereas the Western tradition is all like the body, debate, discussion, you know. So uh, I thought it's very, uh, so the Tibetan, somehow in that tradition, Tibetan traditional art got uh, sucked in. So in order for me, I could, um, either become like a mutated you know, work which won't have any evolutionary sense, then the work will be completely different. So my approach was to form like a bridge where I'm using the traditional vocabulary but trying to make a contemporary sentence. So some would react, some would react very badly to start with my mother. <laughs> and, um, but slowly, I think they understand. But I use the very Buddhist philosophy. I say, this is not Buddha, or this is not that. This is a patch of color. This is a patch of, you know, if you philosophical debate, everything is dependent on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and even just to follow up that, that same idea, how do you see the difference between what's happening in North India with the Buddhist art and you know, coming to Tibet and that sort of transformation that's taking place? Yeah. <coughs> well, I think as Desenla was saying, uh, in Tibet, this idea of innovation is something considered very dangerous. They say wrong so, that's something you made up yourself. It doesn't come from the Buddha. And so, of course, there have been many innovations over the course of, of Buddhist art, both in India and Tibet, but it all must always be represented as just the continuation of the tradition that can be traced back. So that idea of lineage remains very important even on the, on the artistic side. And as we know, the Tibetans were, before they learned to become artists themselves, they imported artists from Nepal to make their temples and do the murals because they wanted the most beautiful pieces of all of their religious devotion and then they learn from them. So this same master-disciple relationship we see in Buddhist practice, we also see in Buddhist art in Tibet. I'm currently doing a project on uh, images of the Buddha as being, uh, or having a life of their own, being alive. Um, and one uh, example of this, I believe, is the Joe of Shakyamuni in Masa, in Joka. And I was wondering how this idea, or what you think of this idea, this, these images as being uh, alive uh, as manifestations of the Buddha, and uh, if it uh, affects your own work. Uh, to be honest, my, my attempt at looking at traditional art is always to look at it as an artwork, to look at it without any religious baggage. And then when you look at, say, a wrathful deity, you can compare the composition with Degas, you know, ballet dancers. So um, sometimes I think when, that's why for me, 
That's why it's very important, I think, the freedom of expression should begin at the very moment when you're seeing a subject matter. Not like after you paint it and somebody censor you. This like many times I think our attitude censors it. So um, so with Buddha and all for me it's more like a stage for my uh, thoughts to pour in and then somebody who looks at it also pours in their thought and then I think the image will always have as long as you give the freedom to somebody's looking at it it'll always be new I think every day Although, I, I just wanted to follow up on your question a little bit uh, with the draw of Buddha um, and, and being this, um, in a sense, authentic portrait. Um, uh, the Udayana Buddha idea, and uh, there's this idea that there was Buddha cast his shadow, or sometimes uh, a less wood image was made because he was going to leave. I mean, there are a number of accounts. And then this becomes then an authentic portrait that then gets copied. This, I think, is very interesting when you think about the transfer of, of images from one place to another, especially across the station. I wonder, I mean, if you might have any thoughts. <coughs> well, I mean, the, an image is not a, a Buddha until it's been consecrated, right? And so there are very elaborate ceremonies in all forms of Buddhism in order to consecrate the image by painting the eyes, in some cases we have in Japan, for example, they, you can open up a little door in the back of the statue and find little silk lung and heart and liver, silk viscera. Yeah. Uh, some we think perhaps in some cases that they were provided because the statue had been wounded in order to make that incision. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly in any Buddhist country, until the statue has been consecrated, it's not worthy of worship. <coughs> and once it's been consecrated, it is a Buddha. It's not an image of the Buddha. The Buddha has descended from the Dharmadhatu and entered into that image. And you say a mantra, and he can't get out. <laughs> Is that like Buddhist transubstantiation? Uh, you could call it that, al although uh, it stays there forever. That, that is, uh, we, we know in the case of Tibetan Buddhism, when a uh, an image has to be moved for some reason, uh, uh, and an image sometimes has to be broken because uh, it's been something's been built around it, and you can't get it through the door, and you have to break the arms off before it, it, it is removed. You have to then request the Buddha to leave the image, go back home, <laughs> while we knock your arms off, and then and then we'll fix it, and you can come back. And so, uh, it's it's transubstantiation, but it, it's it's it's. It's eternal in a certain sense, right? We have to think of taking your exhibit on the road to other Tibetan communities internationally to give them the same feeling that we gave to the community of India, and perhaps on a smaller scale, which is such a wonderful thing for you to do. I'm sure everyone there children it's gone now though right <laughs> get some more <laughs> it's, I think it's quite um, very um, difficult I think I, when I looked at the laws over here if it's a soil it needs to be in a lab for two oh yeah, hours right. and all those things so basically it's illegal to transport soil. Even some players, cricket players, when they have soil on their shoes, it gets confiscated. So, but I think some <coughs> other project, interesting, better ones will come. We couldn't hear all that. Oh, to, to summarize, uh, transporting soil is illegal. I mean, at the, at the core. What was the question? The core is, oh, might the soil project be, be done again? Here. Go ahead. You can't make it through customs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a new project is, right. is the better solution. Um, is there any last question? I think we've used up our, our, our hour, but uh, we can always run over for a moment if anyone has any. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, 
Any concluding thought? Um, just to, to respond to um, Dr. Lopez said about uh, the initiation of the of the Buddha and that the you know it remains enlivened. Uh, it certainly raises a lot of questions about the images that we have here in the, uh, in the exhibit, which which are astounding. Uh, this is this is one thing. But then another thing I was thinking, um, Tenzin, is that uh, I've been reading object-oriented ontology lately, the new uh, thread of philosophy, uh, and the author I'm reading talks about Monet um, and the water and the lilies um, and saying that the agency or the subjecthood is in fact in the water and that the lily is sort of bringing the water to life. And so I wonder if it challenges some of the ideas of this difference between art and religious practice, religious use. Yeah, I, I, for me, when I look at a garbage, it's a sculpture. <laughs> so I think sometimes we are so used to a product which is called art. And then we, we, we structure our thoughts around it, you know. But if you think of uh, aesthetics, uh, aestheticism, from Socrates onwards, they have been discussing about what art is. Some find it in the equation of Einstein, which is, you know, <coughs> and some on Monet and all those things. But I think when it when you talk about religion or art, you know, if the word religion is connecting oneself to the source, then I think art is also like that. So, uh, without any institution. I, I'm still learning, so I don't know. <laughs> it's a very big question. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, certainly it's an interesting question vis-a-vis -vis the museum, which is, of course, full of uh, you know, religious images from you know, all over the world. Um, and yet it's not really a religious space, so I suppose that's up to the individual. I just want to thank both of you for, for coming, and all of you.